Once again, hello, Church One. And once again, it is unique, but also great to be with you in this format. I um, have had some conversations with some of you recently that are, uh, for various reasons, um, not able to be with us uh, one-to-one in church personally, but so grateful that we get to be together this way. And uh, what I do want to say is... um, if you are um, needing to reach out and wanting uh, a conversation, a prayer, um, and just a, a friendly ear, I, I just uh, encourage, um, plead with you, ask you to just reach out to one of us. We would be glad to hear from you. Sometimes it's hard to know uh, what people need and how they're doing uh, we don't see them. So please, please let us know. Uh, we're taking a shift. I know uh, Mike recently finished up a series in Ephesians and we are uh, jumping into the book of James. I'm not sure if every teacher is going to pick up the baton on this one, but I certainly am. It, uh, the lectionary actually starts us this week in James chapter two. But a little bit about James. He, along with Peter, Paul, and John were sort of the Uh, founders or leaders in the early church. James uh, starting the very first church in Jerusalem. James, this is James, the brother of Jesus, the author of the book of James. Um, Being the brother of Jesus, it certainly had some unique insights, uh, some beautiful ones into the person of Jesus. The book of James finds itself in the context of a wisdom literature book. Uh, Wisdom literature, it's a genre that focuses on uh, both divinity, not just uh, limited to uh, sacred texts of scripture, but um, in general, it's a genre as well. But the wisdom literature focuses on divinity and virtue. Another way of sort of thinking about that or looking at that is it looks at, in our case for sure, when it comes to scripture, it looks at the person of God and how we're supposed to act, um, which is very interesting because there's a special emphasis in John in James's writing here on the connection between who we are and what we do. You will see it today, and hopefully you'll see it uh, throughout the book of James if you choose to continue to read uh, the context of this chapter 2, uh, verses 1 to 17. So that would include chapter 1 and then the rest of the book. But special emphasis in James's writing on the connection between who we are and our actions and what we do. Interesting, uh, the only uh, additional context I'm going to give to today's reading is a a concept that James uh, pulls out in chapter one. And I'm going to actually refer back to it a little bit uh, because I think it's really important. um, And it just kind of sets a little bit of a stage for today's reading. In James 1.23, in the opening chapter of James's uh, this epistle, he says, anyone who listens to the word but does, does not do what it says. There's that action word. Uh, anyone who listens to the word and doesn't do what it says is like someone who looks in a mirror and after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. So this concept of a mirror is uh, directly related to the sacred text of Scripture. And, and what James is saying here, and what his, uh, he says over and over in so many different ways in James, is that when we look here, when we open up the text of Scripture, uh, we are afforded our identity. We are afforded an understanding of who we are. We, we go here, it's like a mirror. It says, Sarah, this is who you are. Th- this is you and your fullness. This is what you were created for. You're deeply loved. You're terribly flawed. You were created for works. I mean, I'll name some of them for you, but this is who Christ is. This is how he wants to empower you. This is who you are. And, and in chapter one, that mirror image, he's saying it's as if there are some people that do that walk away and completely forget their identity. He's talking, I just want to be clear, this mirror concept, he's talking about being afforded the opportunity to understand who we are and that our actions, our behavior flows out of an identity. 
So with that in mind, um, I want you to listen to these uh, 17 verses, the first 17 verses in chapter two. And I want you to listen, uh, attune your ears to listen for words of identity and words. Uh, words of principles of how we are to live and act as Christians. Identity, uh, live and act. Uh, Father, thank you for your word as always. Uh, it is powerful. It is meant to instruct, inform, inspire, and change us. Um, Lord, may uh, your word accomplish what it is designed and uh, what we have no control over actually let it do its work in our lives as we uh, just just for a few minutes just jump in and attempt to understand uh, James chapter 2, verses 1 to 17. Thank you. James 2, my brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, you must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into one of your meetings wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy, filthy clothes comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing the fine clothes and you say, here's a good seat for you, and you say to the poor man, you stand here or sit on the floor by my feet, have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of this world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom promised those who love him? But if you dishonor the poor, is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are not, are not they the ones dragging you into court? Are not they the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in scripture that says, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you're... You sin and you are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. Whoever keeps the law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking it all. For he who said you should not commit adultery also said you should not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but you do commit murder, you're a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such a faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes or daily food. If one of you says to him, go in peace and be warm, be well fed, but does nothing about their needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, dead. Action. Uh, do you hear it in these scriptures? What we do. Uh, you hear it in the beginning, right? How do we treat somebody that is different from us? How do we treat someone that has different, uh, by their appearance, is different than us? By their clothing is that uh, example here. Uh, well, how do we treat somebody? Uh, also, the example here is money or status. Uh, somebody that has either power or even our, maybe even our perceived power. How do we treat somebody that has a different um, housing situation than us. Uh, and uh, I don't need to fill it in. The list can go on and on and on. Anything that you would um, end in an ism, ageism, racism, ableism, uh, discrimination, doesn't end in ism, um, but th there's, the list is so much bigger, and we know it. And we, um, if, we're, if we're truly honest with ourselves, we know the places uh, where we... Um, where it rubs against us a little bit, the the sense of treating the other different. Um, uh, another thing he says is do not dishonor. So there's a treatment of somebody perceived different than us that we just, um, he's saying treat all people the same. Um, and then he's saying don't dishonor the poor. In another place in these verses, he says, uh, whatever you do, do not dishonor them. Uh, other uh, other passages of scripture uh, say, um, do not uh, discriminate against, do not harm, do not, it is an interesting choice of language, but bring honor. Another way to say it would be say to bring, he's saying bring honor to the poor. And a third way is just, are you meeting their basic needs? So at three places, there's kind of three, I'm not saying there's not more, but I'm, we're going to highlight kind of three 
action kind of things from these passages. This is what we're to do. Of all the things James could have chosen in the context of these passages, he's saying, here's where the rubber meets the road. How you treat people that you're different from, especially ones that have perceived power. How you're acting, are you honoring the poor? Because he's, he makes the claim God is honoring them. Are you honoring them? Are we honoring them? And then uh, are, what are you doing to just meet basic needs? And then uh, based on, you know, wisdom literature, how, what, how he set out the mirror, he's saying, because that's this, what this will instruct you who you are, those things. This instructs us of that. Um, so it should come from that. Um, and then he puts this in this context of that it's, we're in the, we're under this law. He calls it a royal law of treating our neighbor as ourselves. So uh, James, he, he, in the opening line in verse one, he says, Christ is glorious Christ. He is the one. He grew up with Jesus. He didn't always believe in him, uh, but he, he came to faith in Christ. And he's saying, I, look, I shared a bathroom with the guy. I know he is deserving of our praise and glory. I know him. He is deserving that, that word glorious in, the, in verse one, highest honor. Um, it's a royal law. It's not just a law, it's royal. It's coming from a king and a kingdom that has no end, a glorious king. And he's saying in this law, there's freedom and there's a new way. We are to love our neighbor as ourself. That is the context that he is saying. That is the identity that we get from here is I'm to love my neighbor as myself. Jonathan Edwards has a, um, I don't know if you'd call it a, an article, <laughs> it's called The Duty of Charity to the Poor. You can find it online. It was written in 1732. He, uh, the title of this uh, paper, I would call it a paper. I'm sure he didn't think he was writing a paper. or might have been a sermon. Uh, the Duty of Charity the, to the Poor, Explained and Enforced. And uh, what Jonathan Edwards does in this is he, he kind of goes through every possible objection an individual could have to not loving the poor and embracing the poor. It's an incredible read. I highly recommend it. Um, but he, he here's one thing. I'm just going to read you. I'll, I'll whet your appetite. Just one thing he says about why we might. Some people may object against charity to a particular object or person because he's an of an ill sort of person. Again, written a long time ago. So you have to weed through the uh, English. Um, he deserves not that people should be kind to him. In other words, he's choice in this life. This person is the X, Y, and Z. He deserves people not to be kind. He's not of a very ill temper. He's an ungrateful spirit. He, um, he deserves what's coming to him. And then he goes on to say, but we are obliged to relieve this person in want, notwithstanding these things, both by the general and particular rules of God's word. First, we are obliged to do so by the general rule of Scripture. And he says that of the same context James uses, Jonathan Edwards says that of loving our neighbors as ourselves. And then Edwards goes on and has a whole lot of Scripture in there uh, stemming out from loving our neighbor, but starting with loving your neighbor as yourself. So um, in a practical ways, what is James and Edwards saying? To love your neighbor as yourself, so when you think, just let's be rubber meets the road, practical. When somebody's hungry, cold, needs clothes, what happens when Sarah's hungry? <laughs> I'm a little hungry right now. Um, what happens when we're hungry? Really ravenous. We are single focused and we are go after being fed. We are intentional and nothing will get in the way if we're hungry enough of us getting food. So you can make the same claim for when we're cold. We will run after being warm. Uh, I've had gone on walks where I've been rained on and I'm cold and shivering when I get home and I will run into my house. The claim of James putting the context of loving your neighbor as yourself into these three action items of honoring those that, uh, that in our perception are weaker, of caring for, of honoring the poor, and then of, uh, of meeting practical needs. He puts us in the context of loving your neighbor as yourself. And with this understanding, we are not only to care for the poor, 
we are to be stumbling over one another, running toward them to get their needs met. That's, that's what this mirror is saying. And why? Because that's what God did with us when we were hungry, when we needed feeding, when we were undeserving, when we were in need, he ran to us. And so this scripture is just telling us that that is our, that is uh, how we are to be informed of our posture toward the poor. Uh, we had a realtor in Boulder, Colorado named Judy, Judy Pitt. Uh, she was a realtor, a friend, and we also went to church with her. She's a fascinating woman. I uh, have been texting her this week because I wanted to remember the actual story and the context of what she did. Uh, the demographics of our church in Boulder, Colorado was very similar to Church One, uh, very similar in, I would say, economics, very similar in uh, differing, differing ages, uh, very similar in uh, race. Um, and so I, I, I thought this story is so interesting when it comes to, uh, so Boulder has and had 25 years ago and continues to have quite a problem with homelessness. It's a it's one of the sunniest places in the United States. And so from a sheer temperature and weather uh, point of view, it's uh, there is at one time, I don't know if this is still true, but at one time that was the place of more retired CEOs. And so there was a lot of economic wealth being poured into Boulder. And so there was money. And so um, if you're making off your, if some of your survival is related on, is related to other people's generosity, there were a lot of people there that had a lot of funds. Um, but Judy would take, uh, back to Judy, she would take the high school students who she ministered to. Uh, she was a high school minister. She was the Paul Foreman of our church in Boulder. And she would, uh, uh, one Sunday a year, she would take, go down to where the homeless individuals were. And, she, and she'd and she set this up a couple days ahead of time. But she would say, hey, on Sunday, if you want, um, I, I've got a bunch of kids that are willing to come and ask for money. And they're willing to kind of put on clothes and things and not look like, you know, kids that go to church one. They're willing to come in, and um, but they'll they'll collect money for you if you want to come to church. And so, you know, the high school students were for this, and and she obviously found enough individuals that she filled the front row in our church. Uh, and so she took these individuals, and they said, Judy, we can't come. We smell, or um, you know, we live on the streets. And 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 she said, No, no, no. We'll get you. We'll go in the bathroom. You guys can clean up. We'll get you whatever you need that you want to clean up. And. Um, if you want different clothes, we'll get them, but don't feel like you have to have that. This is who you are, and we want you to feel comfortable. So anyway, they came to church, front row. Um, I, uh, I love that she did this. Um, uh, the, the whole story is it doesn't have a super fortunate ending because the church didn't love it. It's intentionally why I'm not naming the church. Um, it just was a little too much. But in texting Judy, um, I was reminded of James and Jesus and Jonathan Edwards. Uh, I was reminded of sometimes we just have to run after something and not worry about what people think. Uh, Judy has gone on to start a ministry in Kenya. She went on and on and on with texting this week. And um I challenge you to read um, Edward's ar argument because even if you're uncomfortable right now, which I'm guessing some of you might be, I, I can tell you this and I can't guarantee it. because I don't know every argument you're thinking of, but every argument that I have uh, that I have ever heard about why and how we should deal with the poor, uh, that the poor will always be with us, that they got themselves into this. He, uh, Edwards, through scripture, uh, not only addresses every argument, he does not allow for one excuse for not running toward the poor and loving them as we would love ourselves if we were in that kind of need. That's the point James is trying to make here. So in this context of loving your neighbor as yourself, there's another context that James offers here. And this is a different one. It's where he says, Here's another reason why you should love the poor, because you're breaking the law of God. And then he brings up adultery. So he's saying, by not loving the poor, you're breaking the law of God, just like he's making a similarity to adultery. And he's saying, adultery is not good. Not loving, not running after the poor is not good. 
And James is saying they're on the same in God's eyes. And I think we don't think about it enough. I think we have our issues. And for many of us, we go, that's bad. Adultery. And it is. <laughs> Not denying it. But we don't think greed. That's bad. Or not running after the poor. That's bad. We just don't put it. And I'm in this camp. I'm not saying this from a, this thing. I'm saying it from this. Please, I just want you to hear me. Um, and man, I wish I'm going to about to say something and I'm going to lose some of you and I, I can't worry about it. But I wish we could put this um, understanding of what James is saying about divinity and action doing, coming from being, the plumb line of scripture being our teaching us, I wish we could put this on our hearts and minds when it comes to politics. We recently had some folks over for dinner that uh, there were people around the table that vote differently. And at one and it was a really healthy, wonderful conversation. But at one point in the evening, one of the women said, for people not to see that there are strong Christian principles on both sides of the political forum. They're denying a truce. Uh, there, there are political parties historically that just have a lot more of a plan about what to do with the poor. And there are political parties historically, and I'm not talking about candidates, I'm talking about parties that historically care deeply about moral standards. And James is clearly saying it here you cannot trump one over the other. They're all important in God's eyes. And this is our mirror to determine that. James kind of concludes his passage with this beautiful saying where he says, mercy triumphs over judgment. Do you see it in the end there? He says uh, on, in verse um, 13, judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who's not been merciful. And then uh, just a sentence on its own, mercy triumphs over judgment. Go back to the poor. Go back to uh, politics, if you want. And I want you to think about the difference between judgment and mercy. I live in the city. I work in the city. I love the city because I love the people of the city. Um, but I can't tell you the amount of com comments I have heard from people of faith. Things like, there's no hope for our city. Our city will never change. Our city's in ruin. And many other things. And when I read the mirror, <laughs> what I hear back is, we're the hope. And that's the only plan. And I read that mercy triumphs over judgment. And man, could I judge either political party? Or I could look with mercy on either one and say, well, oh, there's some people that care about things that I see in scripture I should care about. I'm talking about peeling a lot of layers here too. And when I see the city and when I'm in the city, and I know the stories, I know so many stories, they give me mercy. I, I look at someone and I don't think, I can't believe you're laying on the street. I think, I wonder what your story of trauma is. You know what mercy says? It says, Lord, what can I do today to worship you in action toward the poor, toward my brother and sister that has less, less power, less money, you fill in the less less understanding, less wisdom. Um, and, I, and I think that's just a healthy challenge to all of us. I love, 
I, I, I said that question because somebody just this week I was saying on Sunday morning they were, um, it was, it's a longer story, I won't go into the whole story, but she just said she prayed that and God just dumped this uh, situation in her lap. She just said, Lord, how can I worship you in action today toward a neighbor? I believe he is uh, grateful to hear and respond to those types of prayers. At the very end of verse 17 here, James says, um, faith by itself, it is not a, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. And, and we know James well enough to know throughout all of his writings that he is not claiming that faith and action save us. I remember, the entire context of this is that doing flows out of being. Uh, James wasn't there. Maybe he was there when he, when Jesus said uh, he wasn't at the Last Supper. He was not one of the 12 disciples. He wasn't one of those Jameses. But where he says, I'm the vine, you are the branches, connection to the vine is responsible for fruit bearing. Uh, I'm guessing maybe his friend uh, Peter or Paul uh, told him about that famous saying of Jesus. Uh, the famous saying that, uh, when we are connected to the vine, fruit naturally pours out. Or the concept that by, by our fruit, by our actions, you will recognize attachment to the vine. That you can identify a tree by its fruit or a fruit by its vine. You can identify people by the actions. So when people see us, when they see Church One, do they say, Where, what are they connected to? Because look at all that fruit that's happening. And, you, and we see it in, in places, don't we? We see it in apartments that get furnished in days or in Hun's Honey Markets that are uh, it just welcome embraces and lots of other places. I'm not saying that, but uh, we should be both encouraged and also challenged by that question as a church. And, and as individual, what tree are we connected to? Do people see our lives and say, wow, what is the connection to her? Um, my sister, uh, recently I was uh, visiting, and I, I might have mentioned this, a similar a piece of the story a bit ago, but I'm, I, I couldn't help but think of it in this. My sister, it was late one evening, we were sharing a hotel room, visiting our brother. It was some difficult days. Uh, my brother is in a difficult place, and so we were just, just kind of in the foxhole together, for lack of a better word, and um, kind of coming up for air late at night, laying in bed, pillow talk kind of time. And she just was stumbling over her words, saying, there's just something about you, Sarah, that, like, like, and she used, like, a lot of words, but she just, she goes, I don't know. Maybe it's your faith. <laughs> she said a lot of complimentary things. And the whole time she's talking, um, I was thinking, she's just, she's seeing the fruit bearing. And I think the older I get, the easier the story is for me to tell. It just happened. But these kind of stories, because there was a time in my life I would stumble over telling the story because I would be so happy that people see those kind of things in me. Not that I'm not happy or not happy about it now. It, my immediate response now is, oh, I know where the source of that comes from. It's just more immediate. It's quicker. There's just less ego. I'm not saying I don't have ego. I just have less. Um, and James is trying to say that here. Ha live a live an individual life that people are going to be wondering, ah, where, where's that coming from? A and he's also saying, I, I can help you. I can help you know uh, how to bear fruit. And it's not by trying to bear fruit. It's by knowing your identity. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Uh, thanks for the identity that you want to give us and uh, teach us. Lord, would we be uh, individuals that not only look in the mirror, but that we would walk away and remember. Amen.